What we've been doing is reading a number of texts and last week we read a Kant analytic, you can see it behind me on this virtual uh, background, of the beautiful. The analytic of the beautiful, so coming to us at the end of September, nonetheless left us with a few strands to tease out for the purposes of review. So this is a supplemental lecture, asynchronous, uh, to use the language we had, the synchronous version of that. Uh, this is the new hybrid lingo that we're using for Zoom instruction. Now, obviously, as noted already and in class, one can, and uh, of course, one should dedicate an entire course to framing and there's a supplement reading Kant's critique of the power of judgment. Just to cite the title of the Cambridge edition, I also have the text here, translation by Paul Gaia. You see that image uh, there, and Eric Matthews. But in practice, it turns out that it's common to reduce the text, all 484 pages of it in the Academy edition pagination, to encapsulating phrases like disinterested interest, right, as you see there, or purposeless purposiveness. With respect to the last formula, as the philosopher Robert Wood points out in his Aesthetics in the Kantian Project, quote, it seems odd that a work dedicated to an analysis of feeling should focus upon judgment and that it should include teleological as well as aesthetic judgment. That's actually a very good summary of the text and all of its parts. Uh, you might want to take a look at it. It's available as a PDF. But what links them, Wood goes on to say, is the central concept of the work, nature, viewed as art. And that's very important because sometimes you can you can lose Kant's reference to nature in some discussions of the uh, critique of judgment. The work of art, as Kant emphasizes, has to seem natural, that is unforced, non-artificial, unartificial, quite as if it had uh, transpired by nature. As Kant writes, when he reminds us in the title of his section 45, this is that beautiful art is an art to the extent that it seems at the same time to be nature. The judgment, as Kant goes on to clarify, is a reciprocal one. Thus in a passage that draws on, we can see that here, the feeling of freedom in the play of our cognitive powers, one of the more elliptical, the play, the idea of free play, formulas that are often noted in connection with Kant's aesthetics, has to be, as he goes on to say, free play that must at the same time be purposive. This is held to be beautiful if at the same time it looked like art. Now, Wood, who lives in Dallas, in his essay, if you read it, which you can do, uses the phrase pretty as a picture. Uh, he means it to be a cliche, and it is that even in Texas, uh, which is the reason he invokes it. But what we're talking about, what he's talking about there, the play between the natural and the artful is precisely what you'd be looking for if you were to seek out and it's autumn at the moment, the colors of the season, the fall season on a good day, hoping to find them, which is what you'd be looking to do, at what one tends to call in the New England area, uh, the Eastern seaboard, peak beauty. Now, the phrase pretty as a picture is what you're going to be looking for because you're not interested, you're looking for something more like that in random leaves. But if you go beyond the city off to Pennsylvania, or even if one wanders over from the Fordham Rose Hill campus itself to the Bronx Botanical Gardens, which just happens to be a great site for checking out the change of the seasons, because there, there is a gardener's aesthetic already operative and the same holds, of course, for most botanic gardens. Think of the botanic gardens that Schopenhauer 
was want to wander in Dresden. Now they're part of the Technische Universität. I think only really the gate remained. There can still be a few of the last roses of summer left at the moment. And if you go, if the, if, if the botanical gardens are open, I think they've in some cases become open to the public because what makes a perfect selfie or photo to document the moment on Instagram is the same kind of pretty as a picture, Wood's phrase, picture book, builder book, beauty. Again, Kant reminds us as he continues, he goes on in section 45, we're still talking about that, that art can only be called beautiful if we are aware that it's art, that would be a kind of immediate talos or uh, end purpose, it has to be art as such, and yet it looks to us like nature. Here Kant is careful to warn against the mannered the obviously artful, the obviously artificial. And to that extent, one might have good cause to think of dance. We had an image and we you saw a bit of that with Barbara Morgan. Here she is with, uh, at the time they were married, Eric Hawkins. And instructively, and we might want to think about that, dance isn't always one of the arts that happen to be mentioned in connection with philosophical aesthetics. Hence, art although certainly intentional, this is the quote, must nevertheless not seem intentional. That is, and here can't repeat, beautiful art must be regarded as nature, although of course one is aware of it as art. It has to seem natural, it can't be forced. Kant takes care to emphasize that emulation, that's the phrase he uses, is risky, a point we can illuminate with reference to modern art and its copies. We're going to want to do that, not by way of Nelson Goodman and his tokens here as sketches of the kind art students might follow, or Goodman's systematic reflections on denotation, but the pop and up art provocation that was the originality of Andy Warhol. And which, arguably, the Chinese artist Wang Guangyi calculatedly appropriates for his own part, not via corporate capitalist culture alone, Campbell's soup cans say, in which if you, if you go down to Midtown, uh, you can see at the Museum of Modern Art, again, assuming it's open in times of COVID, or the yet more famous Brillo boxes that we saw before, or even the more famous, yet more famous icons of the Hollywood art world. Dante will go back to talking about Liz, this image of Liz in his later, one of his last writings. Or indeed, and tragically, as Jean Baudrillard also notes, the death triptych, this isn't the death triptych, this is actually the very much alive Liz and Andy uh, art world image, but the death triptych of Marilyn Monroe and which Wang Yi extends to the dynamic between Chinese communism and Mao iconography, including Warhol's own Mao portraits as Wang Yi covers these in his own work. I think I have an image, yes I do, but not less, and this for me is very important and I've written about this, to the Renaissance iconography of Mantecna and iconic religious art, lamentation over the dead Christ, sometimes just called dead Christ, and uh, one of a series of uh, what, what uh, Wang Guanyi calls new religion. Now, Kant always, and you can look at section 49, uh, emphasizes against the dangers of aping boldness, modernness, and the pressures of the stilted and affected, and one could try and see what we would make of that, but that's not uh, for the purpose at the moment. The pleasure in the beautiful is thus defined as the quote, that which pleases in the mere judging. That's of course why we're talking about the power of judgment. The difficulty of reducing Kant, and that's something which uh, this supplement is meant to look at, to Kant's formulae is that these only make sense in terms of Kant's entire critical project. And we spend some time in, in, in class trying to highlight the significance of judgment as such, that is, of the statement, the claim, the judgment, this is beautiful, where what is predicated of the subject in question is the judgment of taste. 
as Hume would speak of it, or beauty. This is emphasized in Wood's essay, but it's also advanced in Rob Van Gowen's essay, which is also available as a PDF in dialogue with David Wiegens, and it's a theme for Jens Kuhlenkampf. As Kuhlenkampf summarizes, as he puts it in his reading between Kant and David Hume, Kant observes that as a matter of fact, we speak of beauty and deformity, and one may add of other aesthetic qualities as if they were qualities of the object, and we in fact claim to be objectively right in our aesthetic judgments. It would be wrong to say this object is beautiful if, Kulmuf Kamp continues here, we only wanted to express the fact that we are pleased in beholding it. Kant, as you may further argue, is concerned as he tells us to explore the basis of what can be offered as a pure aesthetic judgment a judgment based on some principle a priori. Now we remember this language from the first critique, and we also recall that it requires, as Kant explains, a deduction, that is, a legitimation of its presumption, which must be added to its exposition, if that is, it concerns a satisfaction or dissatisfaction in the form of the object. Here the claims Kant advances allow formulaic expression, specifying that the judgment of taste determines its object with regard to satisfaction as beauty, with the claim to the assent of everyone as if it were objective for Kant. This is matched by the absence of determination via proof as such, and is thus, and here the qualification is a crucial, as if it were merely subjective. One cannot compel assent because, and now we're back to the Abbé Dubot, we see here his reflexion critique sur la poésie et sur la peinture, uh, critical reflections on poetry, painting, and music. But of course, we're only referencing him, we brought him up already, Kant kind of refers to him with regard to the ragout, to his stew. And the requisite demand for me to determine whether the flavoring is as it should be, that I myself taste the object in question for myself. <laughs> Kant, who is here listing an array of peculiarities concerning the judgment of taste, notes that, having shifted to an evaluation, not of a foodstuff, that's not what he's talking about here, but between all tulips collectively, logically, and a single tulip, there, there are two here, but still, Note the logical index, because my discovery of my satisfaction is universally valid, turns on the crucial detail that, although we're continuing the quote here, it has merely subjective validity. It nevertheless makes a claim on all subjects of a kind that could only be made if it were an object of judgment resting on cognitive grounds and capable of being compelled by means of a proof. Now, to be sure and to be clear, this corresponds only to its formal, as if, to use the language of Hans Weinger, structure as a judgment. Thus Kant goes on to emphasize, this is section 34, that no objective principle of taste is possible. Here he sets himself contra Hume obviously, as he specifically refers to Hume, deftly drawing in both the reference to the stew, Dubo, and the critical standard that Hume ambitions for his own part. Although Kant writes, critics, as Hume says, can reason more plausibly than cooks, they still suffer the same fate as them, as the cooks. To this extent, at issue concerns, the Kant goes on, not the exposition of the ter determining ground of this sort of aesthetic judgment in uh, a universally usable formula, that would be the same sort of formal indication to which Kant is liable, as we began by noting, and which would indeed correspond <coughs> to the standard Hume proposed as necessary, whether, and that's another question I argue, Hume himself sought it is perhaps another question which could be resolved if it can be resolved only via stylistic taste, irony and the like, which I would also regulate as hermeneutic and which here Kant continues to say is impossible. <clears throat> so he, he's not letting go of his own observation 
but the investigation of the faculties of cognition and their functions in these judgments and laying out and examples, the reciprocal that should be a, a, the subjective purposiveness about which it has been shown above that its form in a given or representation is the beauty of the object. Now, <clears throat> Kant continues to differentiate between a critique of taste that might be regarded as an art that would be exemplary by contrast with a science that of course would be necessary and noting that he's concerned solely with the latter as transcendental critique. This Kant says in section 37 to explain that it's an empirical judgment that I perceive and judge an object with pleasure, that's empirical, but it's an a priori judgment, that's what he's gonna be looking for, that I find it beautiful, that is, that I may have acquired that satisfaction of everyone as necessary. The procedure Kant follows allows him to offer his argument regarding the census communis. There are a number of, I have a, a slide here, <clears throat> the Kantian subject, the census communis by Kant, uh, as we see, but also uh, Kimmerle uh, and uh, Usterling have an, a, a kind of an edited with, with Kering, Salzman, and Neumann, a whole array of the possible common judgments between art and politics. And then of course we see the same thing, although that's his critique, there's common sense <laughs> that, 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 that gives a kind of Thomas Paine illusion, but it's really all about Kant. And these books don't even scratch the surface. There's really a lot on this, but Kant goes on to remind his readers of the maxims. That's what he calls them here of the common human understanding and he lists them. These are those maxims to think for oneself. Remember, they're also related to the supper. Uh, 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 they, they're too, you know. um, <clears throat> and prejudice, to be unprejudiced and that of course, to go towards the understanding, to think of the position of everyone else, which of course requires that one assume a broad minded perspective, which is after all the objective component of judging or judgment. And always, because you've got to avoid contradiction between one and two, to think in accord with oneself. So that's the requirement of consistency or reason. Now I've intercalated Kant's subsequent characterization of these ways of thinking in this D limited list for grounding activity. And it's one of the reasons that students of political theory are gonna to wanna to read the third critique as liberation from superstition, Kant writes, is called enlightenment. This also leads to a wonderfully free formula. And we're gonna see this again when we get to Gadamer, but, but, but to a somewhat of another uh, perspective and other thinkers only where the imagination in its freedom arouses the understanding into a regular play. Is the representation communicated not as a thought, but as the inner feeling of a purposive state of mind? Now, well, we didn't make any reference in class formally as such, but which is also and always crucial for Kant in his own milieu and for us to this day is Kant's attention to genius defined as beautiful art as such section 46 where he writes that genius is the inborn predisposition of the mind in genium through which nature gives the rule to art. Here, were we perhaps in search of a reference to the mimetic, we see this continues that genius is entirely opposed, and, and Kant's going to claim this is by universal agreement to the spirit of imitation, just copying things. This can yield one of the prime sources of our modern idealization of originality. It's also the je ne sais quoi of which Howard Kegel speaks in its English historical expression, and Kant is still, uh, here's the taste in civil society, which I keep encouraging you to read, but Kant is still articulating this point vis-a-vis -vis Hume, of course, but not less vis-a-vis -vis Plato, because it's Plato's own point, as he articulates this in Socrates' mouth in the Apology, as Kant goes on to write that no Homer or Wieland can indicate how his ideas, which are fantastic and yet at the same time, which in thought, Homer would have been the reference for Plato and uh, Socrates, Wieland, we see him here very much the reference for Kant's own contemporaries. So fantastic ideas, 
And yet, which in thought, our eyes and come together in his head. How did he do it? How can he do it? Remember that Socrates same question in the Apology. Because, as Kant answers here, he himself doesn't know it and thus cannot teach it to anyone else either. The reflection is more than incidental as Kant reminds us that there is a specific relation between genius and taste. And one may, and we already mentioned the, in class, we did this, but here we have maybe an image. Yes, I do. The nose, do you see her smelling there? In the French comedy film, Les Parfums, uh, just to kind of give an indication of this. And this same sentiment has been explored in various films. That's a comedy, but the others are kind of a little more serious in French and English cinema, including Alan Rickman, no less, uh, who coincidentally, this is more serious, but also stars in a, this isn't about a murderer, this is more bottle shock, an in-your-face California wine fantasy and another comedy, which has a basis in fact and very much suits the California sensibility, their wines are as good as your wines and so on, and stipulated, which is very much the reason that Hume adverts to wine as a matter of objectivity, though of course we emphasize that Hume needs there to be an actual thing in the wine, you talk about a metallic taste, there better be some, maybe a key, rusted key in that, or a little taste of lather. And rather than that be something like the taste of tobacco or vanilla, he's going to suggest that there really should be an old key on a leather song. So the same correspondent, serious correspondent, would be the reason that I mean, there's our you. Analytic philosophers, there are a lot of them actually, like Barry Smith and others, including uh, Carolyn, uh, of course, Maya, as you see, love this, as it's mediated via quantification, no less, in Parker points. Helpful if your wine store lists the Parker numbers beneath the vintages they sell, which is often very much the reason they do. As Kant writes, on the relation of genius to taste, for the judging of beautiful objects as such, taste is required. But for beautiful art itself, for producing such objects, genius is required. So he has a lovely parallel. Here, the poetic element is key. Poiesis. And Heidegger will pick up on this, as Nietzsche likewise does. It's the difference between, as we'll see the week after the current week, uh, what Nietzsche calls the art of the spectator and the art of the artist. And Kant himself makes his own mimetic contribution here as he distinguishes between and thereby explains that a beauty of nature is a beautiful thing. The beauty of art, a beautiful representation of a thing. Now, we can move from Kant to Hegel if we turn to consider Kant's reflection on intuition or on Schau, distinguishing the intuition required to demonstrate the reality of our concepts between empirical concepts, examples, and pure concepts of the understanding. Those are schemata. Here the challenge is the symbolic, where to a concept, this is a quote, which only reason can think and to which no sensible intuition can be adequate and intuition is attributed with which the power of judgment proceeds in a way merely analogous to that which it observes in schematization. That is, it's merely the form of this procedure, not of the intuition itself, and thus merely the form of the reflection, not the content, which corresponds to the concept. Kant proceeds to tell us that in both cases we're dealing with hypotyposis, the term deriving from the title of a multi-volume said to have been eight, we don't know, they're all lost, work of commentary on the New Testament attributed to Clement of Alexandria and lost in its entirety and therefore only relevant to theologians. Somehow this word has not entered routine aesthetic conventionality, though one could say there are elements in Lieta or even Bodria, or it's certainly a Gambin. That is, for Kant, presentations, exhibitiones, as effectively metonymic, whereby the symbolic is merely a species of the intuitive. We're then given a summary 
making clear analogy to moral judgment. One, the beautiful pleases uh, immediately, but only in reflecting intuition, not like morality and the concept. Two, it pleases without any interest, very important. The morally good is, of course, necessarily connected with an interest, and there's actually a parallel to a certain aesthetic of the beautiful with regard to nature, but not with one that precedes the judgment on the satisfaction, but rather with one that is thereby first produced, and he goes on, the freedom of the imagination, thus of the sensibility of our faculty, is representing in the judging of the beautiful as in accord with the lawfulness of the understanding, and then for the subjective principle for judging of the beautiful is represented as universal, that is, valid for everyone, but not as knowable by any universal concept. There's much, much more to be said, but we have thereby a sense of both the importance of Kant for aesthetics, as well as a sense of his provocation. Part of the reason why it's provocative is logical. What are we to do with the notions of disinterested interest or purposive, purposivelessness? I should apologize for that. Or the adherent, determined, and the vague and accordingly free. Or indeed the distinction to be made between nature that appears as if it were by art without being artful or artificial while nonetheless leaving space for the aesthetic achievement. Kant actually points to this, we'll conclude with this, of a fabricated flower. As such, all of these are artificial. And what's art? This is that same last example, which appears as if by nature, these have to seem natural. We began in just the same way by noting last week in section four, what we might now regard as Kant's own arabesques. People often use the phrase, a uh, number of authors use the phrase to use the more somber language of Oscar Wilde, flowers, free patterns, lines aimlessly intertwined in each other under the name of foliage, signify nothing, do not depend upon any determinate, definite concept, and yet, please. The same example and its exemplifications of freedom, including the vague reference to wallpaper, occurs in section 16. That's the locus. We talked about that in class of Kant's reference to pulcritudo vaga, or merely adherent beauty, pulcritude adherens. So one between those two as a contrast. Kant tells us that flowers are free beauties of nature, just as he also reminds us that we need to know what things are or are meant to be to judge of them as beautiful. You need to know that this is a lipizan, stallion lipizana. Kant can also tell us, and he does, also anticipating Hegel, that only the human is beautiful only the human being, uh, that depending upon, as he goes on and Hegel falls almost lockstep in the parallel, depending upon our culture, our context. And also add that here, that this free beauty can vary from culture to culture as Kant will tell us, including its significance and the art perhaps of arrangement and not less as Kant goes on to distinguish art from handcraft, the liberal from the remunerated, the paid from the unpaid, which are paid to do isn't art in the same way as it belongs to the handcrafts, which art, of course, being a matter of the free. And in section 42, on the intellectual interest that we might have in the beautiful, what benefit for Kant can be drawn for the soul, and not less shades of Schiller and Hegel, who will speak of the beautiful soul. Kant says that to take an immediate, immediate interest, unmediated interest in the beauty of nature, and not merely to have taste in order to judge it, appraise what value it might have, exploitation is always a mark of a good soul, and he means that morally. Note the point, which is oblique here. One can appraise nature as an investor, a speculator, but that'll mean that one will have another end or purpose of a specific kind in mind. Here, there is a key, perhaps two or four, an aesthetic ecology, even one dedicated to conservation, as Kant says. It's a long quote, but it's all about this. 
one would be unwilling for it to be entirely absent from nature, even though some harm might come to him from the observer from it, rather than there being any prospect of advantage to him from it, takes an immediate and certainly spiritual, the same word, intellectual interest in the beauty of nature, whereby, as Kant explicitly explains, complicating the formula of disinterest, not only the form of its product, but also its existence. Pleasure to him. One is delighted to see that there is such a thing. Here the artful, and Monsanto can take notice, Bill Gates likewise, but also survivalists who mean to wait out an oncoming disaster, say, in an underground bunker after the supposed end of the natural world, a problem with unrestrained capitalism, and capitalism as COVID, our current crisis shows us, is unwilling to submit to any restraints on the exploitation of nature, which exploitation, don't forget, continue to pace throughout lockdown and is and continues to still be ongoing. For Kant, so dedicated must one be in the appreciation of free and natural beauty that even if, and here the reference is to Leibniz's identity of indiscernibles, and there's a concomitant argument that might also be made regarding artificial intelligence, we found ourselves as lovers of the beautiful bereft of the former charm we'd taken in the appearance and existence of natural beauty. So he says this connection, however, claims he claims it's of note that were we to play trick on a lover of the beautiful and plant in the ground artificial flowers, you can tell this is not really real, which can be made so as to look just like natural ones and perch artfully carved birds on the branches of trees. And he, our lover of the beautiful, were to find out how he'd been taken in. The immediate interest which these things previously had for him would at once vanish. Now, Kant goes on to say that if you reveal these things which seem to be real, and they're delightful as real, recognizing that they are artifices, strip what you had previously been looking for of the previous charm, and if there's any charm that remains, maybe there's a different interest in its stead of vanity in decorating his room with them for the eyes of others. Maybe he thinks I should get some for myself could be convenient. This, to be sure, is an indictment of a Disneyland avant la lettre, right? Here's a natural bird as opposed to the false parakeet. But Kant means thereby to show they were also deprived thereby of a formally sure indication of a morally good way of thinking. And with that, we go with our yellow rose to Hegel. Hegel, of course, is going to talk, as Goethe also does, of a red rose. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>